Hello everyone, I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space, and I'm uh, pleased to be joined today by Curie Scott, who is going to talk with us about phenomenographical research and drawing. But before we get started, if you are new to Method Space, this is a blog community sponsored by Sage Publications. We're interested in all things to do with research, design, planning, conducting, then writing about it, sharing results in all kinds of ways, hopefully making an impact, making a difference. And at the heart of this diagram, we have teaching and learning because uh, we're looking for opportunities to learn something new and share new approaches um, at whatever level, whether you're an experienced researcher or a new researcher. So um, I today will be very uh, excited to learn about phenomenographical research. So Curie, why don't you um, introduce yourself and we can get started. Hello, um, I'm Curie Scott. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, I thought I'd give you a background on um, as, uh, as Janet has said, um, I did a drawing PhD, so I recently completed it. Um, so just to tell you my relationship with uh, drawing and also my background, because as researchers, our background really matters. Mm -hmm. So um, in the past, um, I don't know if you can see this, because yes. just tell me if, if there's a problem. So, um, I trained initially as a medical doctor and um, that obviously gave me an opportunity to meet people at their most vulnerable times. And I remember that I, I drew things for them. Um, if we had a language barrier, you know, I used a drawing. I, you're not taught about that. I, I just know I did that. Um, I then moved into um, health practice and um, I taught health professional students and I drew to explain things. Again, it was quite natural for me to do that. Uh, so concepts that people weren't getting. Um, so more recently I've been in, I've run an education um, teaching qualification. So I meet new uh, uh, people from different disciplines, often who have done their PhDs and are coming into higher education. And um, within that course, I introduced drawing to them um, as well. Um, most of them were quite surprised about it and actually quite a few have used it well. So I know that drawing has, if you like, worked. Mm -hmm. um, as an aside, I used to draw as a child, but I stopped um, probably about the age of 14. And I picked it up um, when I was lecturing just to dabble. I don't actually draw much, um, but I paint. Um, in my, I was also a coach, or and I am a coach, and uh, that was for students and staff at the university. And there are various diagrams that are in coaching practice, so um, that you fill in or you get people to do. Uh, I then came to the point of becoming a researcher. I got a scholarship on drawing as a teaching tool for health professionals. And I guess that was my journeying into this drawing and mark making. So hopefully as you look at it, you'll kind of go, oh, I didn't know drawing was that. Um, so I now work as a facilitator, as so a workshop facilitator, academic coach, and um, project work in arts and wellbeing or arts and health. And expressive drawing is something I do, um, kind of threads through everything. So um, do interrupt if you want to and ask. Uh, so um, in my, when I was in the drawing research, I was um, really intrigued by this aspect. So I'll let you read it and then I'll come back in. Actually, for those that are yeah, that struggle with reading, I'll I'll read it out. So okay. drawing me, yeah, okay. So this this is what really caught me. Drawing needs to be reaffirmed as intelligent practice, mm -hmm. and that I love that because right. it 
it helps us think and and that's what i wanted to go with um there's a type of drawing it doesn't have a name this was rosenberg's quote is as close as i could do it's basically um so designers kind of draw as they map out their ideas they sketch them out for mm. ideas so ideational drawing so that's what caught my attention and that's the sort of thing i've worked up um, one of the contributions which is what we are going to talk about is um, that i created a novel research design that was one of my contributions from the phd so when I looked at the literature about how drawing is used in research practice, it's usually as drawing elicitation. So mm -hmm. you'll ask somebody a question and they will draw and talk about it. Right. So it's, uh, and that's quite common, it's called a draw and write or draw and tell. Mm -hmm. But it's often one image at one particular time and the image isn't the drawing is used as a sort of conduit to the conversation which is brilliant it's really helpful but the drawing is not interrogated itself and right. nobody's really asked about what was it like to draw what were you thinking how did it make you feel what mm -hmm. came up right. and i liked that emergent inductive type of thing and therefore um i could not find any off-the-shelf drawing methodology right. Um, that did what I wanted to do, which is in the bullet points. So, um, no, I, I agree. It, you know, the, the while there are um, a number of books and you know excellent books and, and materials about visual methods. Yes. Um, when I looked at doing you know similar kinds of things, I found there was you know really a kind of a, a limitation in the literature. But you know, when right. I talk about these things, I'd say, well you know, thinking in terms of of the usual question and answer that we have with uh, interviews or questionnaires yeah. or surveys or other kinds of methods where I ask the question, you give the answer. And I said, well, can we ask the question in images? Can we give the answer in images? <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, which, you know, certainly is an elicitation kind of an approach. But as you say, it's so much richer than that there's really a lot more that you can um explore yeah yeah so absolutely. tell us more so um one of i had five research questions i haven't put them in this presentation but mm -hmm. i have taken research question one so research question one is well you know how am i going to do this how can drawing be used to explore perceptions of aging i'll just cut in there um the reason i picked aging is you'll remember i was doing this project in reference to health professionals which is my area of practice and so what i wanted to do is use drawing in order to think about a health professional um, issue that was um, big one of those wicked problems they're called um, so we've got aging populations mm -hmm. now um, and it hits everybody and it, 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 it's a major issue. So that's why I chose about uh, aging. The thing that intrigued me is that it's the one group, um, there's quite a lot of stigma about aging. There's a lot of stereotyping, um, but it is the only type of group of people that most of us will probably become. Right. So, you know, if you've got, so gender is another one that people can become, but it, it, it's slightly different. It's, mm -hmm. it's a massive choice. This one is going to happen to us as the days pass. So, you know, the, the, me as I am is going to be older me tomorrow and older me in 40 years. Oh, so, I just had my birthday, so, you know. <laughs> I'm so, and, and that's what I wanted to look at because I think we are, uh, remember, I was teaching mostly nursing students. Mm -hmm. We are frightened of getting older. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about it. So it's a taboo subject that we're all going to have to look at. And we tend to look at it and think about it far too late. So this is about um, using drawing to think about my self-aging or the people, the participants' mm -hmm. own self-aging. Um, and the answer to that was... Um, this drawing methodology to answer to research question one. Now I had to underpin it with something and this was quite tricky. I chose phenomenography and um, 
but I ne I didn't know about phenomenography. I found phenomenography. Uh, so in that process, I had to, like we all do research wise, had to think about ontology and epistemology, which were not even words I knew. Um, and um, basically I realized that I have come, there were, as I went through the PhD, I realized that I had these and I've called them ghosts of positivism. Um, I was trained in medicine. I also have another degree, which I didn't put on that circle, in pharmacology. So these are hard sciences. Mm -hmm. And basically, cause and effect are one of the things we really like. You know, we're kind of like, okay, there's that effect. Let's go look at the cause. And so it's that, that ontology that things are connected and you can find out truth easily. I then went into education where there's still that thinking. But I realized it didn't work. It didn't work for the students that were in front of me because they had emotions about their previous science learning. And so I had to teach differently because, because I, you, you can't just give a test and expect it to work. Right, right. It's, they've got a person in the mix. So I realized that actually I'd moved to interpretivism. And then for this project, I realized actually there's a couple of other dynamics. It's about us aging and our own mm. histories and stories. And so I realized that actually what I was grounding this on was relativism, so that people hold diverse ways of knowing or separate realities which are socially constructed. So I realized that that to do with aging was important. Um, epistemology, not so complex. Um, I, it, this is much more around social construction learning, if you like, um, that we, the researchers, and our participants co-create understandings. I realize not everybody will agree with that and I'm absolutely fine. As an aside, in my pharmacology degree, I had to extract a rat muscle and put drops of uh, different chemicals on it and test what happened. That I would say was not relativism. That was, you know, that was very clear cut. What I did and what happened to the muscle. So I'm, I, there's different positions. Um, we, we need different approaches to study different things. I mean, exactly. There's, there's that's it. That's, it. that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the aging studies are very positivistic, you know, in terms of looking at correlations. This isn't one of those. Mm -hmm. um, so this was my catchy title, elucidating perceptions of aging through participatory drawing, a phenomenographic approach. Um, and these bubbles are just to show that it pulled on drawing research, aging research, visual research methods and educational research. So um, I haven't put a slide on this, Janet, but just picking up your point, you're really right, because when I looked at visual research methods, I didn't find enough even to kind of, um, there wasn't enough substance there for me to build an entire drawing methodology from it. Um, and that's fine. Um, but I then went on to a side shoot arts based research approaches. And I realized my work probably fits very well there. So uh, that's when you are looking at process. What happens during a process of art making. Um, so this is the background. I called it the drawing program. Um, two definitions very quickly drawing a very broad definition, mark making. So we are not drawing, you know, representational things. I'm not saying, um, I'll just pick something from here. Here is a little sculpture of a polar bear, probably the worst thing to see on, in white. Please draw it. Mm -hmm. That's not the type of drawing we did. Mm -hmm. We did this mark making, which will make sense in a bit. Um, and aging was simply signs of growing older. Okay, so I thought we'd go into phenomenography. Um, Janet, would you like to ask anything before I go through this? Is it is it uh, something you're familiar with? Because you're no, I, I in interest. I'm familiar with phenomenology, but I yeah. I'm not familiar with this, and I doubt that many of our, yeah. our viewers are. So you know, to explain it to us. Great. Okay. So when I was asked, um, you know, my my supervisors agreed that yeah, I'd be doing drawing. I wanted this to direct the methods, so it would be a methodology. 
but they said you need to underpin it with something have some framework you're a new researcher you know and so that that was fine but i then struggled um the closest i got was case study research but that didn't quite fit or ethnographic research mm. But in both of those, and I know researchers take these in different ways, in both of those, you are, you are an outsider. You tend to be an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, no, I am definitely an insider because I'm actually designing the program that people are coming on. I needed something congruent with that. I stumbled across phenomenography um, in, in a book, a very short book, so I had about three pages of it and I thought, oh, and as I dug into it, it was this phrase that was so important. So Martin and Booth are um, critical authors. They're the, the, the main authors. Mm -hmm. And they talk about a researcher inquires into participants, ways of experiencing aspects of the world. And it was this bit in a research situation that is of her own molding, their own world, i.e. a researcher's own molding. So I was like, oh, okay, so I dug a bit deeper. And this is about, so phenomenography, these are their, if you like, um, tenets. Um, they, the acceptance is that there are a number of qualitatively different ways something, anything is experienced. There's a few ways. They come from a, or oh, sorry, not they, this uh, type of approach is a non-dualistic ontology. So basically they're saying there's objective stuff and there's subjective stuff that are going on. There's a mix and an overlap in what's happening. Um, and they also say um, that you, the researcher, can be across the spectrum in terms of ontology and epistemology. Anybody can use this. Quite a few debates about that. I'll mm -hmm. show you, it'll come in another diagram. So in phenomenography, and this is a major difference um, with phenomenology, whatever you're doing, whatever you're looking at, you're looking across the accounts for the variation of conceptions and how they relate. So you're not saying this person said this and this person said this. Um, you are looking at across. So you really, um, you lose the individual in a way in order to get a collective account. So it's not an individual account, it's a collective account. And then the products are what they call categories of description, which um, are emerge from the data. So it all fitted in what I was expecting. I wanted people to engage with the program, produce things, tell me what emerged from them, so um, that it was inductive. So this fitted as I went through. Um, so these categories of descriptions are arranged in an outcome space. I haven't included analysis or outcomes in, in this profile, mm -hmm. mainly because it will need quite a lot of explanation, but obviously very happy to share. But this yeah, is just the grounding. A future, a future discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, yeah, when I went through, I was like, absolutely. I also had participants that were younger and older. And what, what, um, what I was being asked is, oh, is this you're going to see what the younger people say versus the older person? Already people wanted to them and us it, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't want that. We are all going to age unless something gets in the way. Um, and whatever age we are, I'd like your perspective on aging. So I wanted a collective voice. I didn't want a young and old. Um, and that was quite interesting. So, um, we did this diagram. Now, it'll take a little bit of unpacking. It's based on Bowden, another core person. Um, and Bowden is one of the writers that I suggest right at the end. I'll give you um, one uh, source. So um, here we've got, let's just say me, we've got Curie, the researcher. The researcher is looking at or investigating an object of study. Now that is true for any research process. A researcher is looking into something. Um, however, in phenomenography, it says, hang on a minute, whatever is your object or the objective part of your study, actually, if you have, if you're, if you're with people, <laughs> if you've got human subjects, I've called them participants, then 
you you have to uh, um, acknowledge and um, you know you, you are human and you have to acknowledge that you have a relationship with the subjects and participants mm -hmm. you also have a relationship with whatever your object of study is so it's basically this triangle we may say say phenomenographers we may say that we're looking at a certain thing and try and knock out other factors but actually it's really important to say uh, there are participants that you have a relationship and with the aspects of the world so let's let's put it a different way uh, my supervisors quite rightly said Kira you're going on this project on which is on self-aging what are your perceptions of aging and I found it really difficult to articulate it took me ages but their point quite rightly is you as a researcher Kiri, need to know your biases and your assumptions and your beliefs because that will affect how you interrogate information that comes from your subjects does that make sense mm -hmm. yes do you want to ask anything about about these essentially they just exist yeah how, how does this uh compare to phenomenology because i think you know looking at, at yeah the diagram, that you know when when i would try to explain phenomenology to, to people I say well you know you have the what you call the object of study yeah. but rather than sort of directly uh investigating the object of study what if what you're interested in in phenomenology is what are the perceptions and experiences of that object so i'm not trying you're to right. no, look no, at no. the object and measure the object or yes you know look at the phenomenon you know i'm i'm interested in how people experience that phenomenon Absolutely. so in my research that about collaboration where i use ph phenomenology rather than say looking at collaboration and collaborative learning and how people learn to be a part of a collaborative process you know, rather than looking at say the stages and the steps and da, 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 i wanted to know well, what is the experience of people who have been in these situations so it seems like that is uh, a, a common uh, feature exactly, exactly. I, I think you're absolutely spot on any research um any research that is looking at people's perceptions are looking at people's perceptions of whatever is happening mm -hmm. um, and they are trying to so in that case i would say you're absolutely right it, in effect we're both as part of the process doing the same thing however where it differs if i go back a slide is in this way this is not phenomenology down here mm -hmm. So I, I, from the little I know about phenomenology, it is much more about the, I think one of the words is the essence, um, and um, it is very uh, individualized in the way that, the, that phenomenography is. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and I think you can have, uh, neither of them say that you need a particular number, but you'd probably have more people in a phenomenography than a phenomenology one. Mm -hmm. So but I was yeah. wondering about that in terms of mm -hmm. the collective, how exactly. that influences ideas You're about the, the sample. You are absolutely right. So this right at the bottom, this accounts are studied for variations. What is said um, in the guidance is therefore for sampling, you need a broad enough sample for whatever you are looking at. Mm -hmm. um, People interpret that. Would in it, ways. Uh, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but would yeah, having just written something about sampling <laughs> for <Okay. laughs> the last couple of days, and in that I was talking about the sort of the in the broad brush, you have the difference between sort of the uh, hob ho um, a homogeneous sample or a heterogeneous sample. So you know, are you looking for I want to have you know a whole bunch of mothers of two year olds. Perfect. Um, who all you know are in the same social class and the same you know cultural yeah. environment or do i want to have like you know a, a wild variety of you know parents of you know variety of age of kids in a variety of circumstances so i can look you know and how You're that choice 
you know, influences yeah. whatever happens in the study. Everything else could be the same. The research questions, the research approach, the methods for data collection could all be the same. But if you were, but depending on whether, you know, you're trying to go deep within one group or say, what's the wildest, you know, most variation of this type of experience across all different kinds of people, you know, that that, you know, is, is a real um, kind of defining critical factor with the, with the way yeah. the study goes. You're right. And, and you're absolutely spot on. Especially so when you're focused on the collective, I would think that would be exactly, something to think about. Exactly. And this was, and this is a brilliant, um, a brilliant question because actually sampling wise, because I'm, I'm a university lecturer, I, I had naturally thought that I would uh, look at drawing with health professional students um, and I did want to do this but at the point where I thought well I need a collective and a, a variety in my sample I realized actually it would it in truth it would be fine if I just chose health professional students yeah. but actually for me as a researcher I'm looking at aging and I want people um, across an age spectrum and so that was the decision I made. I, I widened uh, the field because I thought, well, mainly also because I think health professionals will, I was aware that health professionals might tell me what, <laughs> tell me the right answers, you know, what's uh, politically correct <laughs> rather than be honest about whatever, you know, it's, it's it, so you're right. The, the collective voice meant that I changed my sampling um, ideas um, and I'll uh, oh, that brings me nicely to who came into the study. So um, I'll carry on. Uh, okay. So the the methodology. This is just before the study. The methodology was my interest in drawing as intellectual activity. So what happens? How do we think when we draw? Is really a question. Um, I also built in, so in the research, it was very clear that the, pretty much anywhere that somebody is asked to draw, uh, when adults are asked to draw, uh, they are really nervous about their drawing. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, I know I can't draw, or, or they freeze, etc. So I built in practice time um, playing with different materials before we recorded, really. Um, and I look, I wanted to look at the process of drawing and the product and not just the words. Mm -hmm. So um, I got people, I'll tell you a bit more about this. There were five key drawings, drawings related to aging that I designed. And although they were slightly different, actually these were the questions. So we sat about in a group and I said, as we'd done the drawing, they'd done the drawing rather, I'd say, take us through your drawing what happened in you as you created the drawing? Was there something you wanted to capture in this drawing and you were unable to, what was it? Uh, and does anything, anyone else want to comment? So that was the feel of it. I basically wanted to know what happened when they drew, what their drawing was about, what they couldn't put in, and anybody else's comment. Um, so, yeah, lots of exciting things. To give you a feel of number three, because that's a, maybe a harder one. What was there something you wanted to capture? Pe people said things like, yeah, I really wanted to put, to color her in in this blue, but I couldn't find the blue. Mm -hmm. So I didn't color her in. Ah, okay. So I, that's not a question I've seen often asked. And I, I really think it's worthwhile thinking about, is there something you want to try and say that you can't quite say? Mm -hmm. So yeah. That was interesting. Um, this uh, thinking type of drawing where you come at the page uh, not knowing quite what's going to emerge, um, I named generative drawing. So it's the process of mark making and it's a very long statement for inactive, emergent, non-propositional thinking to be presenced on the page. So we, we can make marks in order to see them and it accepts indeterminate drawn marks as holders of potential meaning, appreciating drawing as both process and product and connecting drawing with thinking and reflecting. You can tell this is from a PhD mm -hmm. um, with the length of sentence. So 
did you want to ask anything there? Does it make enough sense? No, it makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so the drawing program, I had two drawing program groups. Uh, and so in two separate months, say February and then March group. Um, in each one, I happened to have two health professionals and five people over 60. So I invited health professional students and then I cold called a number of um, organisations in the local area um, where over 60s might be involved. Um, so I didn't do any work in the NHS and that got me around NHS ethics. Um, I will say that I invited, you know, hundreds and hundreds of professional students. I actually overfilled the slot. I was, I was hoping for half and half. Um, so I think in the second group, I, I had accepted nine people. And in the end, only two came because I wasn't getting a huge uptake. Mm -hmm. This is a non-credited part of their learning, really. So, I, I, you know, they came for three hours. So every afternoon between, you know, one and four um for four consecutive weeks and we did this uh generative drawing non-representational drawing this was another different thing uh from drawing projects drawing research otherwise is that they saw each other every week for four weeks and then after that um they could also send me notes you know on or thoughts and then we follow we came back together after two months and my, the reason for bringing us back together is just the one question. What impact did participation in the drawing program have on you? Mm. Another research question. So each week they practice different techniques, different um, exercises, if you like. And then there were five drawings related to aging. And they, um, I haven't actually put them in for you. We can go to them if you want to. Uh, they presented the meaning of their drawing and group discussion. Oh, no, I have put them in. Uh, uh, yeah, they'll come up. I then asked them, quite a difficult thing, I asked them to present the drawings, not to display the drawings at home. Um, just, you know, so it would catch your eye. And uh, if anything else comes up for draw about drawing or ageing, let me know. I kind of thought people weren't going to do that, um, but they did. They'd say, oh, yeah, it was up the stairs and everybody oh, it was in the lounge. Everybody could ask me about it and talk about it. OK, so the research methodology was a drawing methodology underpinned by phenomenography. And that led to the research methods. Um, and basically, these are fairly simple. I invited people into a workshop setting. I did overt participation, participant observation. So. Uh, we had videos on, uh, we had an audio on, um, I took photographs, though I actually stopped doing that because it, it was obvious that it was distracting and intrusive, so I, I stopped, um, and took field notes. And I also had a, a, a helper there as well, an, an observer, researcher. Um, I then had the final drawings that they created their reflections and then I did a small a very short form on dem demographics so that's what I put together um, that's a lot of material I didn't realize uh, <laughs> till I started yeah, but analyzing it, but, it, but it fits together so one of the questions that I have and, and I I want to you to share your drawings the yeah. drawings that came out of this but okay. Yes. When you when you when they came back two months later, did people continue to draw during the, that time on their own when they weren't a part of the research? Did it open up that as something that people continued to do? That's a really good point. So um, it, uh, at the beginning, I asked them what their drawing rela relationship to drawing was. So uh, not not in the group. So they didn't know. I knew that some of them drew anyway. I also knew that others didn't. It is worth saying, and I'm sorry I didn't before, um, that this program was um, explicitly to people that would say they couldn't draw, they didn't know how to draw, that were, you know, anti-drawing, if you like. So it was for anyone rather than those people that can draw. Mm -hmm. Now, the people that came on board were a higher had a higher proportion of people that could draw 
than, than what I meet in the public. So some were comfortable drawing, some had gone to art school. Um, so some already drew or practiced something creative. So drawing was just, was an easier step. Uh, yes, they carried on. Um, some people got very excited. So they were starting to go to drawing, um, uh, exhibitions. We had a particular drawing exhibition which happened to be in the town and it's, it's an, it's an, uh, a national one. So it was called the Jerwood Drawing Prize. So people went to visit that. Uh, one person specifically came to the group and said, look, I've really got into drawing. And she had signed up for a drawing course. She had bought her three drawing books along. She had, she was absolutely just so excited. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, people were more positive about drawing. Uh, whether people that didn't draw started drawing, I don't know. Yeah. They were able to send me their drawings um, if they wanted to. So uh, we did the drawings here, but I also said, if you want to do personal drawing, obviously do that. If you want to mm -hmm. share that, do that. Um, oh, actually, one thing that they did want to do, I, I, I said to them, there's quite an open session for two hours. We've got biscuits. Uh, we always had biscuits um, and hot drinks. Is there anything you want to talk about? And several of them said, oh, well, um, every now and then we mentioned our own personal drawings. Could people bring them? And I, I said, you're very welcome to bring them. So that was an interesting um, turn, if you like. So some brought iPads and shared, others brought tons of sketchbooks. And that was lovely. Yeah. So, so why don't you uh, show us some of the drawings yeah. and uh, you know, talk about yeah. that. So just before I do that, I've got one more slide, which is just to say after the research, uh, after I'd finished, um, it actually opened up an avenue to do a book, which I'm just finishing now. This is what the cover is going to be like. Now, this is not about research um, or research methodologies. However, it is hopefully it's of interest to, to uh, some people this is about how we can use drawing for um health and well-being mm -hmm. so something like the well, COVID, i think i know. mean right now yes people who ha who are not in the health field who are in yes. other disciplines given you know the circumstance that we are in um a lot of people are thinking about well-being and so i think that this will be you know something yeah. that may be of Thank a broader you. interest than yeah and people you know specifically yeah. in the health uh, yeah and i and the other thing that i've done um th this th this is part of a series for health uh or arts for health is the series so it's got dance it's got music it's got uh, it's a very interesting mine is drawing but i also bring in drawing for researchers particularly in health and drawing for educators particularly in health so I've angled it towards that, but those two fields of practice right, will get something from this. So it's got eight chapters. That's, that's the feel of the chapters, just so you know. And now, you know, we can wrap up. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, a series of drawings. I'll let you know when the participants' drawings come up, but these are uh, mostly drawings I learned to draw in the first year of the PhD. So um, most of these uh, drawings are my drawings. Um, and, and that's been really helpful. Um, so some of these are about feelings, others you can see I've got sort of extended arms. This is a, a, a drawing research group that I um, ran, I started, it was very exciting. And then these are diagrams, you know, that you scribble on the back of a, 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 an envelope. We went and we drew in the pub every week. No, once a month. Collage is also drawing. Um, and I did lots of in the moment drawing. Remember, it's all about kind of thinking. Here's the participants pictures. There, there are five examples of those. And I wanted to end for new um, people considering phenomenography. Um, it took me a long time to find this. I had to get it an interlibrary loan on this, but it is 
it is well worth doing. It is actually, if you can still buy it, it is well worth buying um, if you are interested in, in phenomenography. It's very practical. So like chapters three, Akelin's chapters and the appendices kind of, it's much more a how to uh, mm -hmm. than, than just critical discourse. It's more hands-on. There's also a Facebook group and that's been fun. So people post ideas. That's been quite useful to see how people interpret phenomenography uh, and the wide interpretations of it. So, so yeah. Before, um, we, uh, before we close, uh, I just wondered, and these resources are great, we'll post them uh, on the yeah, sure. on the method space uh, space uh, with, the, with the recording. Yeah. Um, but is there any other advice you would give to someone who might be uh, considering uh, an approach like this? Yeah. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's brilliant for perceptions, but perceptions where you want a collective voice, where you want to say, well, in this set of people, this is what was said. Um, it works really, really well. Most um most of the research is not done the way i've done it so most of the research are one-to-one -one interviews um, so please be free to do that there's right. only i only found at the time of doing this or designing i only found two two that used groups so it's much more common to do it one-to-one -one and then just look at the data sets alongside each other look at the transcripts mm -hmm. um that didn't fit with me because I'm a teacher um, and I actually see that most learning, most awareness happens in a socially constructive right, way. Right, so, right. And, um, so, so yeah. With the social constructivism approach. Absolutely. So then that, that also allowed you to have the perceptions, not only of, say, my perceptions of my drawing, exactly. but my perceptions of other people's drawings exactly. and the discussion yeah. that came out of that. Yeah. And, and that was really good. But the other thing that it allowed is, remember, one of the things going right back was this taboo that we have. I'm, I'm in the UK. I think it's probably worldwide. We don't want to talk about the frail, difficult times. Mm. Um, and I wanted to give an opportunity essentially to say we're not going to talk about it we're going to draw about it and then talk about it mm -hmm. um and so i wanted people to hear each other's i wanted to hear people's stories and it had a dramatic effect um for example um this now does split it there was only a couple of times i i split in my writing of this collective variation it was clear that uh, younger people so um, people up to their sort of mid thirties, when they talked about old age, they were thinking about the um, productive, what's called the productive times of old age. Like I'm going to retire, I'm going to have qualified, I'm going to have kids, I'm going to have all the things they're going to have achieved mm -hmm. by then. And they were, it was, they were celebratory. Um, not all of them. Some of them were like, oh, it's going to go downhill. But it's usually those that had experience in their families whereas mm. people that were older from sort of 60 to 80s were much more aware of the decline aspects of aging bringing those two groups together was great because both could respect and see one group could say oh yeah there are some joys actually i don't know why i keep thinking of all the negatives and then would identify that's because three of my friends have died in the last decade Mm -hmm. And that's going to get to you. Whereas people that were younger were saying, well, I don't know anybody that's dying. You know, so I, I, I think doing it in a group was, I would say, worked well. Um, I don't know why people don't do it, but maybe I'm not sure there's much research that is done with groups or let's put it a different way. It's mostly individuals, but something like ethnography or case studies will be groups. Mm -hmm. people so um it's probably that so you can do it individually um most of the drawing there's a little bit with drawing and phenomenography kind of as two separate things but they're all elicitation so the easiest thing to do um is kind of give people a prompt and ask them to draw i would i am more excited in all honesty about the drawing methodology than the phenomenography 
because mm. it's it's the drawing that I'm excited about. Right. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I think uh, this will be of, of interest to our uh, methods-based readers. And uh, thank you so much for, for explaining it to us. Thank you. Okay. See you. <laughs>